Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm Tanya Hughes, and I'm Assistant Professor in Photography and Filmmaking. Um, and today I have the pleasure of introducing our visiting artist this week. Um, and her name is Pinky Bass. So welcome to Pinky. Um, Pinky comes to us from this magical little secret place called Fair Hope, Alabama. Been there, it's lovely, but they're trying to keep it a secret. Um, she earned her MFA from Georgia State University in 1988. And that's also where I went to school, so it's yet another perk. <laughs> um, so her exhibition record is um, very, very, very long, but just to give you some highlights um, of her exhibitions, publications, and in collection list, um, she has works in collections of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, the Polaroid Corporation, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Birmingham Art Museum, Penland School of Arts and Crafts, and Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. She has had publications um, in um, both Aperture and Pinhole Journal, along with several others. And she has had solo exhibitions in places like the Light Factory, which is in um, North Carolina, right? North Carolina, um, and Studio Swan in Atlanta as a part of Atlanta Celebrates Photography. Her most recent exhibition um, is the, in uh, the Mexico City Biennial, and it's a super cool exhibition where half, it's a two-person show, where half of the work is her work, and half of the work are photographs by Carol Demerit, and they're all portraits of Pinky. So kind of a wonderful collaborative um, way of working. Um, I often describe her as being truly fearless in her approach and her processes to art making and also to life, I would say. She's, she's kind of one of my heroes. Um, so let's all please give Pinky Bass a warm welcome. I think the fearless is, okay, is this working good? Yeah. I think the fearless thing comes from the fact that I get bored with stuff, so I have to find something new to try, to play with and to try. And just let me just say ahead of time, I, I, I do consider on some level everything I do is in the play realm. I just feel like that opens me up. I remember I went to some kind of a workshop where we were supposed to take our child and leave them behind and, you know, become mature. And so we got back and we all got in a circle and confessed what happened when we did that. And I never took, I never left my child. I, I didn't leave her where she was. I brought her back with me. So that, that does enter into all that I do. The quote here meant so much to me. Um, it was in a book that a photographer in New Orleans gave me. The skin fitted over the bones like a translucent sheet of gelatin. Number one, silver gelatin. Gelatin's like a big deal in my life. But I'm so interested in the human body, the form, how it functions. What, what it's composed of, what it visually looks like. So the whole idea of what it is to stretch my ideas over the bones of who I am. I think I'm definitely a South Georgia, South Alabama, South Georgia person that will always be a part of what I am. But then I went to Mexico and that's a big hunk of who I am. So as you look at these images, you'll see how some of that has influenced the way I have decided to do things. So. There we go. Um, this, is a big, this was from a film that my father made when I was a year old, so it was an old film camera. The fact that our family basically was doing film stuff along and along was very interesting to me, and I just ran across this. We, we tend not to throw away things, so I ran across this in a book recently. But the fact that there is this attitude about film and about photography that has been a part of my life all along, I think is very significant in terms of what, um, what I've done. I married a Presbyterian minister. I went to Agnes Scott College and majored in Bible and uh, married a Presbyterian minister who was from South Georgia. We actually both had applied to the Board of World Missions, so we ended up moving to Mexico where um, he, was <laughs> he was teaching Greek in Spanish with a South Georgia accent. So it was, it was fun. <laughs> we had a good time. But we had some really good friends. And I really think my whole experience in Mexico influenced me in ways that I would not have thought about otherwise. Um, 
Actually, you can kind of tell my dress has changed a little. <laughs> I loved that suit. It was my wedding suit, but I thought it was <laughs> pretty wonderful. But the people I met were so good. But the most amazing part to me was that the Presbyterian Seminary, this was in Mexico City in, in the uh, section called Coyoacan. The, the best part was that the seminary was across the street from Frida Kahlo's Blue House. And those of you that know about Frida Kahlo and her artwork, they had just begun to open it to the, to the public when we were there. And to walk in and see these paintings that she had done, to see the bed where she was stretched out, where she had to lie with a mirror overhead to be able to see herself and do her paintings lying down in the bed. That whole environment there at her, at her place was just beyond belief. So I didn't, at that time, I wasn't interested in photography. I wasn't, I did art things. I did craft things, but I wouldn't have called myself an artist at that point. I was teaching Bible and teaching music at, at the uh, girls' seminary in Mexico City, but I think that hit me on some place that will continue to be part of who I am and, and, and really started that. So basically, I was having babies. I had two when we got there, and two more were born while we were in Mexico, so that definitely influenced my life, but I realized that one of the early kind of Photograph things I did that actually it was in a painting class, but it, I took a photograph of my husband, then collaged it with newspaper and odds and ends, and then drew it from the collage, not from the photograph. So it was a really kind of interesting progression, but it all, when I look back, I think, okay, it all began with the photograph. So as I say, I, I keep looking back at my life, I realize these things, how they keep popping up and what they mean. So at we, my husband and I were divorced after 24 years. I moved to Atlanta and started at Georgia State and began taking drawing and painting, thinking I was going to be a My mother was an abstract watercolorist, so I just was sure I was going to follow in her footsteps. I, my painting was no good. I just was no good. My drawing's not bad, but my painting was awful. So I took photo one, and. I, I fell in love. It was like, okay, my voice, this is my voice. I understand this medium. So I began doing photographs. Pretty soon I got bored with, as I say, that's one of my problems, with straight 35 millimeter. It was just, there was no dynamic to it. It was like, you know, a portrait or a this or a that. So by a major professor who happened to be John McWilliams, asked if I had ever heard of pinhole photography, which I had not heard. And he suggested that I consider doing that. I got a friend to show me what to do. I, my first camera was probably an oatmeal box. That's what you always start out with for pinhole photography. And I began making images like the ones on the left. And after that, I was sold, partly because I never knew what was going to come out. With the camera, you think, OK, I've got this framed up. I know what's there. With pinhole, you kind of shoot it in that direction. You hope the light's right. You hope you're counting enough numbers to get it to make an exposure and you take what you get. So I, I, I'm not a control person. I don't do well setting things up. So this worked a lot better for me. So I began playing very often with pinhole photography. Those of you that aren't photographers, you use paper instead of film. That was a, a miracle to me. I thought you had to have film to make a photograph. You don't. You have anything that's got photographic emulsion on it can actually serve as a negative. So I began making paper, paper negatives and then playing with the idea of positive and negative. So I would, make a, a neg I would make a picture, which would be a negative. Then I'd lay it on top of another sheet of paper, and it would make a positive. Then I'd take that positive and lay it on another sheet of paper and make another negative. Just that whole transformation of going back and forth between the positive and the negative was very interesting to me. But the big miracle for me came when my 35, well, it wasn't a 35 millimeter. It's a plastic camera, um, Diana's, Dory's, they're, they're Holga's, they're different kinds. They're plastic cameras. They don't have... Nikon lenses or anything fabulous. They kind of vignette and they do odd things. You usually have to tape them to make sure the light doesn't get in. In the case of this picture of the kudzu, turned out I had light leaks. I could never have gotten what I call the heavenly rays if I hadn't had light leaks in that camera. So that became for me an attitude of how I was going to approach photography or how I was going to approach my art. See what happens. Let the, let the image talk to me and tell me what's the next step. So I went the Georgia had, University of Georgia has a studies abroad thing in Cortona, Italy. 
So I applied and went for the program there. I had gotten film from Polaroid. If you, if you send them a photograph that you've made that they want to purchase, they'll send you film. They don't send you money, they'll send you film. But it's in their collection, so I didn't care. And I wanted the film, and I didn't have much money. On the way to Italy, these all became very hot. And so the film itself got damaged. And when I made images, they were solarized. I can't tell from here. Let me just do something here a minute. It's, it's weird. <laughs> Okay, this is a lot. I wonder, the lights can't go a little blower. You can't really see, but um, like in her, up here where her eye is, it's solarized so that it's, can the lights go down just a touch? I, I don't, maybe we could see more. Or, may, or maybe just if you do them. Yeah. Can you see a little bit more of the image? Um, maybe it's because it's so big it's not showing as much. But anyway, up there where her eye is, it, what happened was it became what's called solarized. It meant that um, what's positive turned to negative. So where her eye was, which should have been a positive, became a negative of her eye. And so it was like, that was a gift to, for me, that this had happened. And it was because of the heat and the way it happened in the process of transporting to get there. Things kept happening to me, like my daughter was getting married. We were celebrating in my loft in Atlanta. Uh, the lights went out, and I had my Polaroid camera, and I was taking picture after picture. And for some reason or other, somehow I left it, quote, open, whatever that meant. But we had all these candles around. I did not know at the time, but it, we had flashed one image that had their faces they were spitting all over each other. I don't know, we were at a crazy moment. But the candles started making all these marks on the film, which I discovered later when I pulled it out of the camera. So here again, it was like, okay, I didn't plan this. This wasn't something I could have even thought about doing. But I loved what was happening. So more and more, I became addicted to the idea of things being happenstance. So I began to try to play with that. And New Mexico, where my friend Katie and I would go camping, we literally, I literally took the lichens off of the rock. And with, Polar with the Polaroid positive negative film, you pull it through a, a gizmo that squishes the chemicals between the positive and the negative, developing a positive and a negative. So you look at your positive, and you have a negative to put in the enlarger to make larger images. So I sprinkled these lichens on and ended up with things like birds and dogs and giraffes floating around in my head. It was like, I couldn't have planned that. It just, uh, so anyway, I'm very, I'm very much devoted to the magic of what happens when I play and allow those things to happen. I did try on the other one to be a little more intentional, and I literally, it was a doll's head, a doll's face, and I literally took um, um, scotch tape to paste it on, tape it on in the shape of a, a dollish. It, it's okay, but to me it doesn't really have the magic that the other one has. I mean, it just, it seems intentional, and I'm, I'm just not good with intentional, so. And that's something about myself I've learned. So Kitty, uh, my friend Kitty, I met her when I was in Italy. She was a ceramic artist, did these giant hand-built pieces that were just gorgeous. She was from Charlotte, North Carolina. And so we began to work together and travel together and show Ex exhibit work together. Um, this is an image of her over there. Uh, I think it, I don't know, it seems like, because, maybe it's because it's so large, but she had wonderful what I call eye bags, and that was one of the first things I found out about her was that she didn't mind if I actually photographed her eye bags, that she thought that was actually kind of wonderful. She was interested in the human form. Her pieces were about the human form. So we our, my images of photographs that had human figures and her, her forms all kind of seemed to fit together. So we began to go regularly to Mexico to do these projects. Actually, the one on the left was done at Ghost Ranch out in New Mexico. So this also was in New Mexico. It was in the village, Abiquiu, where Jojo O'Keefe lived. And I don't, you may be familiar with the church that she painted sometimes. That's, what's in the background. Now they have a big sign at the front <laughs> entrance to the town that does not allow you to take pictures of the church, or it says, I mean, you know, people tend to want to 
sneak them anyway, <laughs> but I think they felt like they, they had been used a lot because of her notoriety. But anyway, this was, this was before the sign went up, I will say that. But with this image, when I pulled it out of the, the Polaroid camera, it tore, the, the, the film part of it tore as I pulled it out. So I thought, nah, well, too bad, this thing messed up. And I had on kind of a plaid shirt that I didn't think really looked real good in the image. So when I got home, I thought, okay, well, this is ruined anyway. Why don't I just see what I play with it? So I decided to pour Clorox on my negative. Now, the darkroom people just <laughs> don't need to panic. But I did pour Clorox on it. And fortunately, it ran down in such a way and over and I could stop it in time so that what came out was an image that this is really probably the one I'm most known for. And I don't, you know, that's, that's my, my signature image. So it all came out of things that weren't working right. Now, I did take a, <laughs> a, a, a printmaking course when I was doing my graduate study. And my end project was called, What Do You Do When the Process Fails? None of my prints were any good. But I did make a neat book out of <laughs> all the failures. <laughs> Over here, again, it shows this business of solarization. Her eyes are like a negative image, whereas the rest of it is positive. That I was achieved by being able, with the Polaroid, to be able to pull it out of the camera, open it slightly, which allows sun, it, solar, into it, and that creates that. You can do it in the dark room as well, but there are a lot of ways of doing it. But that, that became sort of something I did on a regular basis. So, basically my camera of choice has been pinhole cameras. I did a whole series at Visual Studies Workshop called uh, Purses. About, um, I, I spent a month there creating purses. For me, the idea of, of what a woman carries in her purse very often, it's identity, it's money, it's um, passport, it's all kinds of things related to what it means to be a woman. So it was really interesting to me, people sent me their favorite old purses, like this Deb bag from Charleston, South Carolina which I just, I thought was just amazing. And it had, it already had all these wonderful beads on it. So to make a pinhole right in the center of the purse, and then I would put either film or paper inside to make the images. One of my dreams about these was how, oh, I could go, I could do secret um, things. I could go to bars or I could go in churches and with my purse and it would look very natural and I would take pictures. Problem is, those of you that have ever done pinhole know <laughs> it would have taken 8, 10, 12 hours to make any kind of an image in that kind of a dark space. So for that use, it wasn't very, but it was still the idea of it I thought was pretty amazing. I probably have, I'd say I probably have 150 cameras at this point. Some of them are can, cans, boxes, anything that you can make a, a dark box with a hole in it that you can open and close and then put some kind of light sensitive material inside can be a camera. So to me, that was really, really interesting. Actually, my bra camera is one, of, <laughs> one that people like a lot. It's a two tassel Elizabeth Turk <laughs> pinhole camera. Basically, it's cones. And of course, you would have to wear it on the outside of your shirt or cut your shirt up or something, I don't know. But anyway, it's the, so the tassels are, are hooked on with Velcro. So basically, it's just a pinhole. The cone is there with the photographic material behind. So you pull off the tassel, and that's the shutter. And then you put it back on, and that closes the shutter. And then you go to the dark room and develop the film. So anyway, then for the Arts Festival of Atlanta, this was, to me, one of my big projects that I, it was just fun to do. but. I, uh, was a six-hole, two-story camera. So there were six holes on three sides of that building that I made up my own version of photo history, which people sat in the dark and listened to. And then after about two or three minutes, the pinholes would open. I had solenoid devices to open the pinholes. And you would see the image of the Arts Festival of Atlanta upside down and backwards. You'd see the balloon lady, but she'd be upside down. You'd see the skyline of Atlanta, but it would be upside down. So any of you that have never been in a camera obscura, it's really an amazing experience. It's just the whole idea. I just think, I, for me, the whole process of art has been about learning something, learning things, finding out things, communicating. When I got ready to do my graduate show, I had just discovered um, the hero's journey and some of you all may know that, and Joseph Campbell. And basically, I was, I had left, um, well, I had divorced my husband. I was no longer 
actively participating in the Presbyterian Church. I didn't know where I was going with my art. I didn't know where I was going with my life. So the idea of a journey to follow was very important. And so this became a part of my thesis. Uh, basically, on the hero's journey, for those that don't know, just real quickly, you, you get a call. And like, I really felt like I had the call to adventure when I was with a missionary. That was part of that, that journey. At this point, when I discovered photography, it was like, okay, this is a call to a new adventure. You go, things happen, there are problems, you have uh, belly of the whale experiences, brokenness, things, tests and ordeals that make you wonder, magical help, which I consider all these strange things that have happened to me in the images. And then you come to a place where you have a supreme ordeal that leads to reward. Joseph Campbell identifies several. The one that I particularly related to and chose to follow was called Steal the Elixir and Run. And that was what I felt like I had done. It's like all the good stuff of my life, all the good stuff that I'd experienced and, or was experiencing, I could just take all that and run with it. And so basically, that goes around. You take the elixir and give it back to the world, which in effect for me was my exhibition, my thesis exhibition. So the whole idea, and then you start all over again. You, you find a new adventure. It's like a new discovery. So that really fit with my whole kind of life understanding. So this was basically that um, exhibition in 88. Um, I laid out the whole gallery according to that plan. So you entered and what you saw at the beginning were images of the struggle of the journey. As you come around, you begin to see the transformation. And then ultimately at the end, I did something that I look back and think is pretty silly, but I had a table set up in which I had made things for sale because so, you know, you get your degree, you're supposed to go make money. So I had made fans, and I made tarot cards, I made little, little things for people to buy. It was, it was an eye-opener for me. You don't do that. I mean, that's not who I was. But it was, it was okay. I mean, that is part of what you think about and what's part of the journey, and you have to deal with. So I think that also helped me maybe on the next leg of the journey. But anyway, it was, it was fun. We had a good party. I had lived during World War II in Fairhope where uh, while Daddy was overseas, um, my parents' mother, mother was a draftsman over in Mobile, and I lived with my grandmother. So it was really a comfortable place for me. Uh, by the time I finished grad school, she had, my grandmother had died, but my Aunt Ruth was living in the old family house, and I knew she had enough extra rooms, so <laughs> I begged for uh, the opportunity to come stay with her for a while, which she gladly allowed me to do. So I had a place from which to function. But then I still was trying to figure out how am I gonna make some money? I mean, she was, you know, she, I had a place to stay and she was, she was feeding me some and I had a little bit of money, not, not much. But I, so that became an issue. That became something that I had to keep thinking about. So I applied to the Alabama State Council on the Arts in the education department to do an education program. And uh, I built a camera, this is a, a camera obscura, pop-up camper, that I actually built the bellows, giant bellows for, that you could actually walk into, and I, it took me two weeks to be able to say this without getting my tongue tied, but I named it Pinky's Portable Pop-Up Pinhole Camera in Dark Room. And this is number two, <laughs> anyway. So literally in this, the, the kids would go into the camera from the door, the pinhole was on the other side, their friends who were outside would be prepared to do antics. They would be ready to move around and jump. The children on the inside would see the reflection of their friends on a sheet that was hung inside the camper, and the kids would be upside down and backwards. They'd be running, they'd be moving. They were obviously, it wasn't me tricking them. I wasn't doing a projector because they knew it was their friends out there. I love it, love doing it with fifth graders because that's where you study the eye. And I remember thinking in the fifth grade, I don't see everything upside down and backwards, but anyway, that was, it was really a great, that was a great project. Went all over the state of Alabama doing this, but I also had the great fun of taking something that I didn't even know existed. Turns out that my grandmother at the turn of the century was making glass negative photographs. I had no idea. It was like they were in a closet somewhere. The family just assumed everybody knew everything. This is a picture of my blind Aunt Nell, who was on the porch, and I think blind Aunt Nell helped her 
very often with her photographs because there are a couple of images that my grandmother is in. So I'm sure Aunt Nell either pushed the button or, I don't know, she, actually blind Aunt Nell was sent down to the bay to take care of the children when they went swimming. I mean, Aunt Nell lived a full life, so they didn't limit her activities to things that you normally think. But anyway, so I had this 150 of these gorgeous glass negatives that were set in the environment of South Alabama. So I began using them in different ways. What I really loved was doing things with that pop-up camper. It, was, it would take a sheet of paper, photographic paper, was three feet by five feet, that I would put inside the camera. It would create this image. I really should have shown this upside down and backwards so, you, so you'd get the idea, but it would create a negative. And so everything would be the negative, but then I would embed one of my grandmother's photographs from the glass negatives. And it would be a positive, and then when we made the negative, I mean, made the positive, her image up in the corner there would be negative and mine would be positive. Anyway, I just went all over that section where she had photographed and re-photographed those sites and, and used her images to embed into that. So that was, that was a great project, but exhausting. I mean, you can imagine. I had to have giant trays. It was really heavy, hard work. I did about six of them, and after that, I was like, okay, this was fun. It's time to move on to some. Now, I wasn't bored with that. It was just, I, it wore me out. I like making cameras out of whatever. These, this was made out of a, a rapid fix box when I was in Mexico. I bought rapid fix so I could use a closet to, for a dark room. And the box is long and slim, so I punched three holes in it so that I could make three images at one time, create the negative, then lay it on top of another piece of paper and make a positive. So the idea of being able to use the world around you to create your imagery was very important for me. I particularly, I like, I like the body forms, but I particularly like the, the shape of the, the jaw for some reason or other. It keeps showing up in work I do. So there's something about all that that, that appeals to my visual aesthetic. My favorite camera made these two pictures. This is the I call it the Bible with two points of view. It, it, it literally had, it really was called the Bible as literature. It was an actual Bible, well, actual book that I took, and it's kind of coming apart, you can tell, and turned into a camera. So basically, I cut out the pages, created a black box out of the pages, and the black box has two holes, one here and one there. So part of what, I did this before I went to Mexico, but part of what I liked about it was that I could do indoor and outdoor imagery. I'm, I'm not particularly an exhibitionist, but I do like using the human form. So being able to do an image indoors with one lens, then taking the camera out and doing another, and being able to have the Polaroid, which gave me that nice large negative that I could then make larger, such as the one that's on the easel over there, that was, became a way for me to work. I like large images that give you access into the imagery, so that was really important for me, but this is one of my favorite cameras. I've, I've got several, I think I've got three Bibles. One of them's Mexican, one Spanish, I liked it a lot. Then I, with that camera, I began the series called Body Nostalgia. That's one of the things that, as I age, I'm very much aware of the, my body changing and things, the transformation. It's not that it's anything that I'm unhappy about. In fact, I actually, when I look at my, I look at the veins in my arms, and I think they're really interesting. They're beautiful, you know. So it, the whole thing of transformation is really interesting to me. But it's also, it's, it, I think it's hard for some people. And so you'll see later that became part of my collaboration with Carolyn Demerit. But the one on the other side is the picture of Kitty. This is, we, I projected onto her a photo, an image of one of her ceramic pieces so that it's a double exposure. It has her face and you can see the, the cracks and crevices in her face, but then this other image that's pasted over the top of it. I don't have the piece here, but it's over in the shooting studio in the exhibition that's there. 
where I've used that same image as a transfer on one of the eco-printed pieces. So if any of you have not seen it and not been in there, if you stop through, I think they're going to leave the door open today and tomorrow, and you can see it. But it, I, I just, when I find an image that has some kind of mystery or seduction that I don't totally understand, I keep using it. And that, to me, to me makes it more interesting. Kitty and I did a lot of traveling together. We went to McClellanville, South Carolina, when uh, Hugo, after Hugo had come in there and devastated the little town of McClellanville. Turns out McClellanville happened to be where my major professor was living. It still is living there. And um, there was detritus everywhere. The, the, the trees that were upturned, I mean, whatever that tree was in this image just was so beautiful to me. But here again, doing the, the process, number one, I did a self-portrait, like just holding it out. I photographed the tree, not knowing for sure where it was in the composition. And then I solarized it, which caused other things to happen. Sometimes those things are beautiful, and sometimes they don't work at all. This one worked, and I was really, really happy with that. This shows you, and so Kitty and I did a show together. These are the kind of pieces that she did. Her ceramic pieces would be like about this high. They were, they're really large ceramic pieces. So we decided we would try to, to put photography on the clay, and we literally covered it in, in um, liquid light and then projected an image of nature onto the, the ceramic piece. And that, so it made a photographic exposure on that. So that was really exciting. But the, the deal was, we realized it was like, these were my pieces on the wall. Those were her pieces on the floor. They were connected on some level, but they weren't collaborative in the way we were wanting. And we decided that we wanted to explore what true collaboration meant. And we went to California. The Marin Headlands has a art place there which gives grants, and we were able to stay there for three months. We did three major projects while we were there, or planned one of them and did it later, but three projects that were presumably us doing what we call true collaboration. In this one, we literally put clay into photo emulsion. So the liquid light, which you can buy in bottles or you can make your own from the chemicals, is mixed literally with clay. So these are actually clay photographs, the, the, the photographic images embedded all the way through the clay. They, they're, some are, we did some that were not on any kind of, this has a little polyester fabric behind it that's actually tobacco cloth that covers the tobacco fields in North Carolina. But that, but that still felt like photography to me. That felt like my project. It was, it was photography. Kid, when we went next to, we went to, after the three weeks, three months there, we went to Penland, North Carolina, which is an art school that's um, up and very well known for arts and crafts. Um, and we constructed what Kitty called Big Mama. This is a big, big, big belly of Mother Earth, she called it. Up there is uh, her, be her belly button, which was actually the pinhole. So it was a giant walk-in pinhole camera. It had a spiral, so it was like a light um, trap so that you could go in. And projected on the wall inside was the landscape outside of Penland, North Carolina, of the, the art school there. So it, it was one of those things that was, it's, we, we guaranteed it for four years. It's still there. We did this in 94, 93, something like that. So it's still there, but it's kind of, the snakes have found their way in, and some, it's, it's always an adventure to get in there. But it's really just, I don't know, the whole idea. But for me, this felt more like Kitty's piece. It was about the form and the structure. That was somehow what it was all about. So it was collaborative, but not quite what we were after. Eventually, we did these pieces in which I had made a black and white photograph of her face. Then we projected sea creatures and um, flowers and dead plants onto her face, and then rephotographed it and made color photographs. I, I, don't, I don't do color, you know, we made zebrachrome photographs. So it did feel like, I mean, we thought they were, we liked them, we thought it was good. So we really felt like we had accomplished what we went for. It wasn't anything that either one of us wanted to keep on doing. It was real, collaboration. Some people, I, we had one friend that said they didn't know how they could do art if they didn't have the other person collaborating. I don't, that, uh, we, we couldn't understand that. We, we came from a different. But it took a while 
for me to get my sense of myself back from that experience. That was a very, um, her, her granddaughter actually wrote her master's thesis called Pinky and Kitty and a Third Thing. And the collaboration was that third thing and what kind of things came out of that in terms of our, our personalities and stuff. Um, so I decided to do a project in Mexico at, in Oaxaca where I would go and stay for six months and I invited people to come and spend two or three weeks and do their own work. So while I stayed there and did that work, people came. During that time was when I really felt like I was sewing myself back together. I needed somehow to get that, that gel back over my bones in a way that I understood it. And so I was, could, I could still do the dark room. I could do little eight by tens. I could get in the closet and turn it into a dark room. I could make an elbow and I could make a hand. I could make different parts of the body and s stitch them together. And in the Mexican banner parade style, I used a lot of satin, and that was, that was a lot of what my project was during that time. It was a very valuable time, and Katie and I basically got along. I mean, we worked through it, but it was, it was a very difficult time. Also, while we were there, we had the interesting experience of meeting a curandera, a healer. We had heard about Maria Sabina, who some of you may know about. Um, she got herself in trouble with mushrooms. <laughs> And a lot of Americans were coming down just to get the mushrooms, not for healing, but for other purposes. Um, her story is a whole other story. But we had heard about her. Then we went looking. There was a professor that taught healing, curandera ship, whatever, in, in the university there. So we went to him. He did a healing ritual on us with herbs that they rub all over your body. And we walked into a restaurant the next day, and there was a whole bouquet of those particular herbs lying on the counter. And we thought, hmm, this is interesting. And so we began a conversation with this young woman. Turns out she was a curandera, a healer, and she was interested in working with us. Not only that, she had a sister who attended medical school at the university. So the two of them worked together in terms of healing and medicine and sharing patients and, and that whole process. But it was really, the whole process was amazing. We would do rituals like the, 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 the fellow had done with us, like the herbs. And then she would have us rub an egg over all of our body. Then you would crack the egg open and drop it in a glass of water. And she, she mentioned to me that if she, was, if she knew more, she would be able to read what, it, what the egg looked like as it went into the water. But we would, we would go out there and do this ritual, and then we would put the, throw the egg into the creek, and it would be washed away. So this was, a, this was an amazing experience. We, I, there, I had 17 different people that came. I think about 10 or 15 of us actually went and did the healing process with her. So that was really, that was, I just added a whole new dimension to my way of thinking that, that I hadn't known before. Kitty actually was invited to go to Macedonia. In, it's a, a, a residency for ceramic artists. So um, she asked if her photo friend could go with her, and they said yes. So this is that image that's up there. This is my, was my preferred format for printing, 30, 32 by 40 images. I liked torn edges because I do feel like life is somehow, we just, it's, Every moment's sort of torn out of time, so I like that. And I, also, I couldn't afford frames, so I like being able to push pin them to the wall. But that that whole experience in Macedonia was really interesting. And she, this young woman was working on Nefertiti, so I did. I, it was a, a cappuccino box was what I got, and made it into a camera. So that was the photograph of her from that experience. This was also from that trip. This woman. Um, Serbian with her daughter was there. And that was one of those positive, negative, solarized things that you can't quite figure out which is the positive and which is the negative. And for me, having that mystery just live there, I just, that was, oops, sorry. That's, is, I just, I love that image for that very reason. I mean, I can really literally see that this is, the, the girl's face is positive, but then her eyes are negative. So that must be the positive and this must be the negative, but this looks kind of positive to me sometimes. So anyway, those, those are the kinds of questions that I like to have my work pose. So Kitty and I continued to do work with the figure in nature. 
um, how, how it looks, how it interacts, and also comparing things. I began to collage, not collage, but do triptychs of things that were like of different material using acrylic lifts with a silver gelatin print with a Xerox print, just to see what kind of contrast, the, image, the surfaces, what the surfaces looked like. And um, up above includes just a plain um, color photograph of my sister's incision where she, she had cancer and where it had begun to, um, they had to go in and, and do surgery. And, and the image, that pinhole image that I had made in Mexico seemed to fit what I felt about what was going on with her. Um, at some point I decided to do something with all my dreams. I had a lot of dreams that didn't make any sense. And sometimes I could put them with images that didn't make any sense. And maybe they read it, maybe they went, went together, they didn't. But I liked that, I, that was a whole series I did of those. When my sister, the cancer got bad, it metastasized to her brain. She moved into Fairhope with my mother and father and me. So it was like we were back together, our family, at, you know, here we are at 60 living with our parents again, sort of, or maybe they were living with us, I don't know. But I began sewing on photographs, and that I could do. That was a small thing I could have in, instead of those large things that were in large trays and lots of chemicals and stuff. So I had images that I had done. This one over here was one that I have loved so much because I started sewing on the thing, and then I thought, well, it needs something else, and so I started doing this. I tried to put something on the head, and then it looked like it, it didn't look right, so I just started cutting that up. Anyway, once I got it to some point, I looked at that thing, and I thought, this is how I feel right now. I hadn't set out to portray how I feel, felt. I was just doing what seemed visually to come to me. So I kinda, I've kind of i always liked that piece, because it, but I was using that uh, figure to create this whole series called uh, Contemplating My Internal Organs when the, those wonderful medical books that show all these illustrations of your systems, just, it was just amazing, I loved them. So I began doing these series of looking at the different internal organs and creating this um, project. I figured out, one of the things I loved was the negative, the backside of these things where I had stitched, I didn't plan them, they just happened to come out that way. So I devised arms that would hang out and so the image would hang down and would, you could turn it back and forth. So you could see the back side as well as the front side. So the whole idea of looking at the, the, the body, the internal organs, and trying to imagine what's going on. And then I got really interested in the whole, um, like um, cross sections of bones that I could then use sort of as um, frames for these things or some of the other, other things that are related to. Didn't always use my own photographs. I would photograph images out of old books. Um, so it looks, it seemed like I felt like I was getting further and further away from photography. Began doing uh, prints on uh, handmade paper that had been done in Italy, stitching into those. Um, oops, let me go over here. Nope, too, I goofed. That's one thing, this one. Okay, wait a minute, I can do it this way maybe. Yeah. Okay, so at some point my sister's cancer got to where all of her hair was gone and my friend Carolyn came to document her and our family and made that image of her and then gave me the image to sew on. So I began this whole process of working with her. I also became in, interested in astrology, the astrological thing. She was not a Scorpio, but to me the Scorpion I don't know, the scorpion on the brain seemed more powerful to me than Pis she was a Pisces, and it just, it wouldn't have had the same impact. So, I, I don't think that, anyway, it was about a visual thing. But um, I kept thinking about different things, like different skeletons, like, like a turtle shell or a crab shell, or that where we live, we, we crab, do a lot of crabbing. So, the whole idea of that, but then the, I was doing these things where as I made holes in the photographs to sew, it was like, okay, this, okay, a pinhole. Okay, I'm making a hole. And the light, then I was doing them with light behind them. So the light was coming through. So it was kind of like it was circling back around again. The pinhole, the hole being cut, the threads going through and connecting all of this. 
it just all felt like it, it was part of a piece. And so this whole, this whole project became very, very exciting to me to do. But then one day I said, uh, I wonder what a photograph would sound like. And uh, I had a friend who actually had one of these music boxes and he, was, he had a landscape and he was running the landscape through the, the box. And I said, what do you think would happen if I did a body through the, through the music box? He said, I don't know, try it. So I began making cameras that could actually, and, and punching holes. This is like a, a player piano. A player piano uses air. This has little tongs that play on the music box. But basically, so obviously it would change with whatever outline of an image I did the sound, but I liked the music. It was kind of like it was an abstract sound, and it somehow, so I did a whole series of these. I mean, the idea of what a photograph sounds like, I think that's, it's a little, I don't know. It, it's, it, a photograph really doesn't sound like that, but on the other hand, it does on some level. So I made a whole bunch that were on cameras. Then I made a bunch that were actually on musical instruments. Um, this, this one here was a tribute to my sister, the, the, her balalaika. And um, then I did a whole bunch that were on mannequins because of, of my obsession with, with the whole thing. And, and the nice part is that, I mean, like, I think this is from this one, yeah, the, the using different kinds of imagery. And they could change depending on, you know, whatever I needed, wherever I was showing it. Um, so anyway, that was, that was, for me, a new way of looking at photography. But like I said, I, okay, so I'm not sure what this has to do with photography. I I'm, I'm feel like I'm moving further and further away. It's like I was so in love with Our Lady of Mercy in Italy, with all the people hanging off of her robe, that I did this giant robe thing that's got pipettes up at the top, but with little children hanging all around the skirt. But then I had crocheted these dresses that were about breech birth and, and internal organs. So I don't know, that was just where I was. And then I got to thinking about even deeper than organs and how they function are our cells. And those of you that have not heard of Henrietta Lacks, you should look up that woman and look up her book and her work. An amazing woman, who, um, a sharecropper, whose cells, she had cancer, her cells were taken without her knowledge, and they were used to, I mean, they have led to so many, her cells have led to so many discoveries. One of the sad stories to me was that at one point, the scientists went to the family. The family didn't understand about this, but they went to the family and said something to them about her cells or using her some way. What they understood when they said that to her, to them, was that she was still alive, that they had kept her alive for all, I mean, they've kept her cells alive for all those years, but they had not kept her alive. And they were totally confused about that. Anyway, the story's in the book. It's Henry, the, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Great reading if anybody's looking at. But these images of cells then here again, it's not my photograph, but I'm just totally in love with how these things look. So I began making up some. These, these didn't have any basis in um, actual reality, but then I began finding actual fo microscopic photographs of cells. And like, this is one that's in the book of, of Henrietta, well, this is one of her cells. And so I was doing what's called Tenerif, a Tenerife lace process where it's basically, to me it's a weaving process, but it's, it's called Tenerife Lace. So I was using those images that I got off of the internet to do these, I mean these cells are just amazing. That's not a really good photograph, but it, I, would like, I liked hanging them inside of a darkened space so that you felt like you were looking somehow in the body with a, I don't know, it's, anyway, I've loved these cells. I've had a good time playing with those. I recently did a project with my son who studies the DNA of corn plants at a, a gallery, and he said, now I can put on my resume that I'm an artist too, so it was, it was good. Um, when I asked to do a project with uh, Alabama, um, as an Alabama photographer, I had been long obsessed with my timeline. I could not remember if Hank was born before Mark, or 
this happened before that. I have a friend, Doug Veloss, that comes and he says, now when did we meet? And, and we go through this all the time. Timelines, that's not my logical way. I'm not a linear kind of thinker, but I became obsessed with wanting to do that. So I began, I made a book and then I began doing all these images for my family. I had my uh, grandmother's girdle here and the, the images go around in a spiral. So they spiral all around, and then this, this one begins another kind of um, decades and goes on to a third one. I was able to actually, I, these were all, they're, they're processes, but they include photography, but they're not, I wouldn't, all, I don't know. They're, they're, some of them are family photographs. I'm, some of them are my photographs, a few are, but basically I'm using other methods of presenting imagery to the world and what I'm talking about. So these are the, all the same images, but they're kind of done in hanging book form. Recently, I was invited to Berry College to do an exhibition, and my Aunt Nell that I mentioned that was on the porch that my grandmother photographed was the subject of this. It's called Blind Vision. Aunt Nell, uh, a mannequin thing of her, she was amazing. She, could, she, she played violin, she read, had records, not it was, before, it was, you know, before the time of cassettes. She raised singing canaries. She could tell us the night that the night blooming cactus were going to open because she could smell it. She would say, "Tonight, you all can stay up till 11 o'clock because they're going to open." And sure enough, these amazing things. Anyway, she married, and I mean, that one of the fun things was we would go around the corner to her house. She would be in the kitchen making us popcorn, and Mr. Boyce would be reading the funny papers to us in the other room. She lived a full life. We played Scrabble. I have a Braille Scrabble set of hers. I just, anyway, Aunt Nell was really, but as I've <sighs> moved along my various issues with my eyes, I've had a cornea problem. I've had, well, everybody has cataracts, but I've got glaucoma. In fact, you know, with this eye, I can't see this hand up here at all. It's like, I'm, things are happening to my vision. And as a visual person, we know that that's a very fearful thing. I did a project once called Fear of Blindness. And I, I, it was a performance piece in the gallery where I pretty much walked around blind. It's interesting, too, how people treat you differently with blindness. But this work I did, and it's what's over in the other gallery, and this is a piece from that, is done on with... Um, I'm using a process called eco-dyeing for fabric and or paper, and somehow the way that looks felt like to me, it wouldn't be exactly what a blind person or a person going blind would see, but it had that same sensibility. So that was what that show, that's how that show came about. So this is one of the pieces that I did from that. One of the things I've learned, I guess, well, I guess I started it with that, was that uh, one of the ways of doing a, on a transfer is to use hand sanitizer. So just, just for the fun of it, I like the idea of things that we don't, I mean, you know, we've got, I've got leaves and branches on some of the pieces over there. They're actual physical leaves that I have boiled that have turned into paper because of the way they've been treated. So I just, I like that whole process. Um, this, this one was one that I wasn't able to bring, but it's a large doily, it's not about this size. And the whole process of being able to do that, but then to incorporate up there, you can see that hand a little bit. That's a photographic image that has been done, um, added into the process. So, so it combines all, it's, it's a collage process on some level, maybe a little more because some of it's, in grain and part of the whole thing. Okay, this, I have to show this. These are five of my greats. I have another and a half on the way. Um, they're, they're amazing kids, but they also inspire me. And I, I saw this person's work, a Japanese woman, that does these things where kids crawl in these kind of giant playpen things. So after one of my, whatever, hip surgery or something, I had time to sit, so I crocheted a big giant playpen for the kids. I mean, to me, that's all part of life, you know? It's, and, and it's so beautiful. And it, I showed it at the nursing home near where I live, and they kind of strung it up over a, a banister, and it was beautiful. It was like a piece of art. I mean, I really wasn't doing it for that, but 
I like that. I mean, and this is what I love the best. It's like, oh, he loved it. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's really important. This is the show that um, Tonya mentioned. It's in Mexico City. Carolyn is on the right, uh, your left. And uh, Alan Bevins from um, Charlotte was the co-curator with the gallery owner. About 25 years ago, Carolyn and I met and began photographing together. And she would ask me to pose. And, and as I said, she came to Fairhope and photographed my sister and my family. She, we'd just kind of been back and forth together for a long time. So she had done this 25 year portrait that she called Infinite Grace. And when Alan saw the pieces where I had sewed on them, he said, oh, you need to come and bring those also um, over here on, well, I'll show you this one in just a minute. It was just, it was one of those things where it just all happened. So the work is still in Mexico. Uh, Carolyn and I aren't sure where it is because every time we see a picture of something of the gallery, it looks like they're still up there and they were supposed to be down a, a month ago. But we hope it'll, they, basically we expect them to come home. But what would happen, she, these are the kind of photographs Carolyn can make. I mean, they're exquisite, they're just on point. But then she would very generously give me a, a copy. They're digital prints, she would give me a copy and then I would do whatever it is I wanted to do on them. And um, it's, it's a really interesting, it's a different kind of collaboration. It's not anything where either one of us have felt like we've been put upon or it's been hard, it's been an easy thing. But I think it was because we didn't set out to do it, it just happened. So I think that's, isn't that all of them? I think that's it. I'm not gonna do it because then you'll see my funny <laughs> page. <laughs> yeah, that's it, so. Okay. So I'll be happy to answer questions or entertain comments or reactions. <laughs> if anybody has anything they want to say. Yeah. Um, how do you get the hand sanitizer transfer? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, particularly the hand sanitizer? Yeah. Uh, if you look on the internet, DASS is a company that produces, it's an acetate that has uh, emulsion on the side that you can run through your printer. Uh, it needs to be um, pigment print. So like a laser print would, ha would do the color. On a regular inkjet printer, usually the black is a pigment print. So since I only do black, I only have a, an inkjet printer, I can run it through these sheets. So basically it's, it looks like the overhead projector things. I've tried using Staples overhead projectors and it doesn't work, but you run this DOS sheet through and then on your paper or fabric, I mean, I like, I, I just use fabric a lot, but so I just basically this whole area, I just cover, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting that thing's up there. I cover it with, um, with the, with the uh, hand sanitizer, then lay that print on top of it, rub it for about a minute, two minutes, and basically, as you lift off the, the acetate, the ink has adhered to the fabric. Look, at, look it up. It's it, DOS. There, there's another. There are other companies that actually have that, the right kind of um, acetate. I just that's just where I get mine, and I don't. I'm not sure what the other. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The fabric that you use in your work sort of is related to your family. Or are those things that you find, or do you make it yourself? The, the, which specifically? So, like, in that piece right there, and, like, the big boilies that you were talking about, um, are those, like, are those related to your family? Very often they are. I, I, I have a family that kept things, like the old camera, and, um, but the big doily that I showed you was actually one somebody found, Carolyn found, in a, flea market. So I, I do go to flea markets and I like looking at things. I think this one is probably a, a, something from my family because, I mean, we just have, you know, <laughs> trunks full of old stuff like this. But I do, um, but yeah, I like using, when I, can have, when I can find family stuff, that's my preference. But if I can't, I, I don't, I like, I like finding stuff. Anybody else? 
Yeah. Um, so we have we have filmmaking students in here too today. Have what? Filmmaking students oh, in here too today. So and when we think about filmmaking, we think about stories, and you brought up like the hero's journey. And then yesterday, you didn't say this, but one of the quotes that I wrote down from one of your other talks was that you see your overall work, like life's work, about telling a story without defining the story. And I really loved that. Could you kind of talk more about that, like finding that line between giving the viewer ambiguity and bringing themselves to it? But I, I think for me, that's always been important, not to define the story so much that it's like a documentary. Uh, that's uh, we we had a recently had a show from a thing in Georgia that's called the Goodwill the good nope I've lost the thing the go good go fund go fund uh, collection and it was called Picture Your Story and I was supposed to look at it and talk about it I expected to find a lot of documentary stuff what I found was basically people that looked at things more like I did which was to put an image there that opened a door for you to begin to look at something but you had to bring your own attitude, your own perception to it. But you still had to have enough of a storyline that it carried through on that. So for me, every time I've done an image where I haven't spelled it all out completely, but I've opened the door for you to bring your imagery or your scenario, your story to it, I feel like I've succeeded on some level. That's for me, is 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 important to me to, to not. It's it is my story. It's there. I mean, I, there's nothing I can do about that. That's how I was born. That's who I am. It's it's like the 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 warp of my life is, is what it is. But all my experiences have added these other the way I, all these other bits and pieces that thou create something new and that open the door for people to have a different perspective and to look at things differently. So. I lo and I love I, I love movies. Oh my God, I love I love film, and I particularly love it when it's like it sucks me in in such a way that I feel like I'm somehow involved in the process, and it doesn't spell everything out. It doesn't you know, it doesn't preach. <laughs> I think that's I think I'm a I don't want anybody preaching at me <laughs> kind of thing. So there is that. Yeah. Um, so one of the most jealous moments of my childhood was when my cousin got to go inside your pop-up camera and then told me about it this summer after you. Oh um, I would have been six and Jonathan would have been eight or nine and my uncle was a high school, I mean, elementary school principal and he was on the board and the arts commission and everything and so like that, I didn't realize that that was you until I was sitting there talking to being oh. and texting with my cousin going, look at this, <laughs> I mean, I understood that they've already done it once, turned the shooting room, the shooting studio into a, a camera obscura. And if, if I'm, like I've said, if some of you have never experienced that, it's, it really is. And so I, the question that I had to go with that was, do you often get to speak with kids that you're still in Fairhope? Do you get to speak with folks who have the opportunity to interact with your work younger? And if so, how does that make you feel as an artist to be able to have sort of that lifelong memory effect on kids? It, it is. It, it, it always like for this is like wow, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, I do run. I do run into people occasionally. Yeah, and that and that you know, it's it's like the whole idea of I, I'm not doing this. I mean, it's like it's really wonderful that I've been able to have shows and and put stuff out there and sell some things. But it's, it's more about my energy and why I get up in the morning, you know, kind of thing. So having these kind of things happen, it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel good. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's so amazing. <laughs> oh, well. I, I kept seeing you smiling at things, and I thought, well, what is it? I'm, <laughs> yeah. I know fear of like the back of my hand, yeah, so yeah, it's like home. Very cool. <laughs>
Yeah. I just have a comment. I, the thing that, that inspires me is that you, after all these years of working and doing this, when you talk about it, the joy just comes out. And you know, it, it, when you were unwrapping the uh, print that you were making yesterday, it was like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. And that's the way I feel. And I just think that's so great that you can continue to feel that way. I, I, to me, if you're doing art and you're not getting joy out of it, that's bad. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Well, okay, so <laughs> one more, Tonya. I so um, it's so you have a theology background, and and your favorite um, camera is this Bible, but then you cut it all up. So I was wondering <laughs> um, if you had to kind of wrestle with that, and also if you continue to sort of wrestle with this conflict between art and religion, or I don't know. But it's very interesting because I had, a, I, after, recently I've, I've, I've had a video come out and some other things, and I've gotten interesting emails from people, but I had a um, message from somebody, and she said that she was struggling to figure out how to keep her art and her Christian beliefs together which never to me, seem, for me, didn't ever seem to be a problem. But she wanted to know how I did it. And, and I think the point is, my theology or my, my belief system encompasses my art. My art is, it's not that art is my religion by any means, but my whole, I, I, I've recently realized that I, if I really am honest about my belief system at this point, I would have to say I'm an agnostic, which means I just don't know. It's not the same as an atheist but I just don't know, but I'm an all-filled agnostic. It's like, yes, oh, I get excited when things happen. So that whole thing of just being open to life and to the world. And so, yes, I, I mentioned in one of the other classes that the first time I, well, when I stole the, the Gideon Bible and cut it up the first time, that was really hard. It was just like, <laughs> that was really, really hard. <laughs> yeah, that was like, ooh. But after you do one, yeah, it gets easier. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, well, and being a Bible major, I, ha I think I had a different attitude about the Bible. I knew a lot about history, and we did our own translations from Greek, and, you know, I, some of the things that I used to believe about the Bible, I had different attitudes about. And like I said, living in Mexico and, and realizing there are these other cultures that don't have any idea what I'm talking about or what this means or why I think this is the way things are. So I think that that made a big difference in my whole, I think my theology may have been the same all along. It's just that it got, I looked at it from different points of view. And I think that's, that's kind of what's going on with that. But, yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I'm glad you came. <laughs> yep.